Even if we suppose that such an incompetent pilot had the opportunity to fly a Boeing 757, we still have to ask ourselves how he managed to violate the most heavily protected airspace in the world. No untracked aircraft get near the Pentagon and in and near the White House. It just doesn't happen. In Washington, D.C., we have one of the most restricted airspaces in the world. It's called P-56. It has a separate radar tracking system and a separate military response system. P-56 is that uh, restricted airspace that is around the Pentagon and the White House, and it, it is a highly, highly, highly sensitive area. There are supposed to be no unknown aircraft that can go through there. That has an air defense identification zone in a 50-mile radius around D.C., and then it has a protected zone 17 miles around the Washington Monument and an inner protected zone three miles around the Capitol. That space is essentially unbreachable. It has to be because of the importance of the buildings there. It's like, it's like an aviation no man's land. Nobody goes in there. Nobody. They have F-16 and F-18 jets at Andrews Air Force Base, about 10 miles south of D.C. They also have the 113th National Guard Air Wing at Anacostia Naval Air Station uh, that can send scrambler jets up in a very short period of time. Both are in place that day. Neither one responds at all until after the Pentagon is hit. In addition to that, the Pentagon has its own defenses. If a plane, any kind of a plane, was coming in towards the Pentagon, why didn't the uh, anti-aircraft missile batteries that are there, why didn't they fire to protect the building? This is, after all, the most heavily protected building on the planet. That craft had to have been a military craft because only the military craft put out a signal. It's called an Identify Friend or Foe IFF device. And only the military craft would be allowed to approach the building the two radar systems that the military radars, defensive radar systems read are a civilian transponder and a military transponder. Military transponder is called IFF. Civilian aircraft do not have an IFF transponder. They are not given that take capability, okay? So if there was a 757, American 757, that went into the Pentagon, for example, um, and it shut off its transponder. It didn't have a military IFF transponder on it. So it was a primary target. It's a primary target going into that airspace. Should have been shot down. What I'm describing to you is a breakdown in standard operating procedure by FAA, NORAD, P-56, and the Pentagon all on the same day in the middle of after 905, what was known nationally to be a terrorist attack and it makes no sense. Nobody goes in there. This is, after all, the most heavily protected building on the planet. It just doesn't make any sense at all. The Pentagon symbolizes our military power in the world. And they had hit it. And uh, to this day, nobody knows what they hit it with, whether it was an airplane or whether it was a missile. And our government will never tell us. So we just kept Wait for the French to explain it. <laughs> what hit it? What's going on? There is nobody anywhere at any point in this entire investigation that has said that is positively American 77. They suppose it, they presume it, they assume it, they say this is what we think it is. The controller, Daniel O'Brien, who saw the unidentified blip coming in from the west at a high rate of speed had no way of knowing what it was because the primary was a primary return only the secondary radar the transponder was turned off in order to identify a primary radar target you have to have two-way communications between the pilot and the air traffic controller and the pilot has to report over a certain geographical location or you have to be able to tell the pilot in the airplane to make a series of turns 
and then the radar can controller can look at all of the primary targets on his or her tra radar scope and say, there's an aircraft, or there's a target that just executed the turns I told. Now I can positively identify the aircraft. That never occurred. It's huge. Now, if Flight 77 really did go off of the radar screen for 36 minutes, according to the her testimony, then the airplane was no longer flying or it was in a it was low enough that it was out of radar coverage one of the two so was the airplane landed at some place some remote field then it does make sense that it lo they lost the airplane for 36 minutes but other than that there's very little explanation for that in the light of what we've seen and heard, it seems that the official version of 9-11 is not sufficient. We want the facts to be explained to us, and above all, we want them to be properly investigated. Basically, we want someone to finally tell us the truth. The United States government spends $892 billion per year to defend its citizens and its territory. It is the best protected country in the world, as President Bush has said. Nevertheless, on the 11th of September, the heart of America was attacked from the sky and 3,000 helpless American citizens were killed in their own cities. If I had been sitting on that committee, the Congressional Committee examining 9-11, the one question that they could not get the Air Force to answer correctly, nor at, was why the fighter planes did not go up automatically when the first planes were found to be hijacked. Any time an airliner goes off course or loses radio communication or loses its transponder signal, any time any one of those three things happen, the aircraft is supposed to be intercepted. On 9-11, all three of those things happened. And still, there was no intercept. Those planes flew around for from 20 minutes to an hour and a half without ever being intercepted. We have direct contacts with our air defense colleagues by means of direct connections that are controlled by this touch screen apparatus. By pressing just one key here, the call is sent, to which the operator of the defense, in this case, answers directly. In the time it takes to answer the telephone call, around two to three seconds, the information can be already exchanged. So why weren't the four hijacked planes intercepted and shot down? Military jets travel much faster than passenger aircraft. It would have been easy for them to catch up the jet planes before they crashed. This airplane can reach a maximum speed of Mach 2.05. This means it exceeds twice the sound barrier. This is approximately 2,400 kilometers per hour. In the northeast of the United States, there are as many as 16 Air Force bases. Why weren't the Boeing jets intercepted? The official story argues that air defense was informed too late. One of the biggest lies is, is that the FAA guys were incompetent. When we lose an airplane, we take action. We do not sit, we do not delay, we do not, we go to protocol. Boom, 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 boom. When the air traffic controllers first saw, saw American 11 start to lose its radio, lose its transponder, go off course, and all of these bad things that are going on, they did not take a coffee break. 67 times in, the, in that year, 2001 up till September, there had been air emergencies. Uh, they can get a plane up in from six to ten minutes uh, and scramble it in 67 times that year in air emergencies, but there was not an instance where an air emergency went ignored for long periods of time until 9-11.
a lot of people down the road say, well, the president had to give authority to shoot aircraft down and stuff like that. That is not true. Uh, an interceptor pilot has the responsibility and the authority on his or her own to shoot down an airplane if they think uh, the situation calls for it. And this is how it would be. You don't have to wait for a military command. You don't have to wait for orders of any kind. That's not an option. That's the law. It's inherent in being a fighter pilot. You know that's what you have to do, unless somebody has told you to stand down. Uh, before 1970, we had one form of scrambling aircraft, and it was immediate, bang, bang, bang. Then in the 1970s, we had some hijackings come into our civil uh, airspace, and that wasn't a quick response. What we did in that is we didn't want the hijackers to know that we were there. So we, we didn't rush the fighters off the ground, and we kind of snuck them up behind the aircraft. So we put a second protocol in, and the reason that the hijacking protocol is slow is because you had to get Pentagon approval before you could release your fighters. Those two type of protocols lasted until June 1st, 2001 three months before 9-11. In June of 2001, Rumsfeld and the Pentagon and the military changed the procedures and instead of having two protocols, one fast, one slow, they went to one protocol, slow. If we had reacted to the in-flight emergency, Immediately, the fighters would have been up and on the way, and those aircraft would never, ever have reached their targets. But when the center controllers came to notifying the military, okay, because they had only one protocol to work with, that protocol went through the Pentagon. Guess what? Guess who didn't answer the phone? Sorry, it was the Pentagon. Here's an analogy that I can give that would help out the common person here. What Rumsfeld did is the fire call comes into the fire station, but before the fire truck gets a chance to leave, it has to call the mayor of the city to get approval for that departure. And what if the mayor is out for breakfast or he's sleeping late and he doesn't answer the phone? Look carefully at this footage shot just a few minutes after the attack on the Pentagon. Notice the man that is helping to carry a casualty. It is the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld. What is he doing here when, as head of the defense of the whole nation, and whilst the United States is still under attack, he is helping tend to the wounded? Why is he not at his command post? The phone calls went to the Pentagon. It went through the military. And the military was sitting there saying, oh, hey, don't answer, you know, don't answer that phone, whatever it might be. <laughs> now, how would you like your fire department to sit there and say, well, I'm sorry, we can't come and put your house out and save your lives because the mayor didn't say so. And on 9-12, they changed the protocols again back to the first protocol, which was the fast scrambles, and that's what it is today. So the way that Rumsfeld's Pentagon managed this whole thing is they, they switched gears, okay? They switched out of having two fast and slow into slow, okay? And then they said, oh, we're bad, 9-12, let's go fast again. 